Gil Tal, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. What is good, brother? Thank you so much. Happy New Year to everybody and yourself. Uh, everything is good, you know. So it's, it's a beautiful day to be alive, and I'm excited to uh, put some knowledge out there for people. Heck yeah! Well, you've got a lot to give. We're excited to have you. Uh, you were referred from our friend Allie Gilbert, who she was on recently, and I really wanted to leverage your expertise to continue to go down kind of the rabbit hole around hormone replacement therapy, as well as kind of get into some more new age or timely aspects of medicine, weight loss, um, health, if you will. And so excited to have this opportunity to chat with you. For those of, uh, of our listeners who don't know who you are, which I'm assuming is the vast majority, maybe you could just give us a, a little context into um, kind of who you are and what you do. Sure. So uh, I'm a registered nurse, and uh, I am the owner and director of a group of medical clinics called Elevate Wellness. Uh, we have offices in New Jersey and in North Carolina. We do offer telemedicine nationwide. Primarily, we only treat men. Our focus is on men's sexual dysfunction and TRT or hormone optimization, primarily due to aging and sometimes some younger folks due to uh, lifestyle or genetic predispositions. Now, while I am a nurse, I have trained many, many physicians and other providers in uh, various uh, aspects of, of their fields, specifically on what we do. I have a vast background in nutrition and fitness. I was a former competitive physique uh, uh, athlete in the NPC, uh, won some regional shows, made it to nationals, placed top 10 in nationals, um, in master's division as well. I'm 45 years old at the moment. Uh, I competed all the way up until the age of 42. Uh, I've owned several fitness centers in New York and New Jersey and uh, have a, a extensive background in not only fitness, but also nutrition. Um, my biochemical uh, career in, in medicine has, has led me into the hormone field, which I've been uh, a, a very deep researcher in for the better part of about 10 years, uh, helped uh, by my last account about 9,000 men around the country and around the world via Next Level Dietetics which I used to offer nutritional coaching, which I now refer out to Ali, as you mentioned earlier, she does a phenomenal job. Yep. But uh, when it comes to the medical aspect, that is something I hold near and dear, uh, because I am a perfectionist, and I look at everything, we leave no stone unturned, we look to optimize people correctly. And we like to treat symptoms and fix individuals rather than using arbitrary numbers uh, to chase, uh, you know, a desired outcome. So uh, with that, uh, I'm happy to go into any topic that you feel your audience may benefit from. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, you're obviously extremely qualified for, for us to be having this conversation. And, and so, like I said, excited to share this information with our listeners in a really useful and applicable way. One of the personal reasons I wanted to have you on this call is, you know, we work with a lot of highly driven men and women, and, and I, I am 43, and I have a lot of guy friends who I have conversations with on a daily basis. You know, I played competitive sports growing up. I played high level competitive rugby. I've got a lot of buddies uh, that are of similar age right now. And for a lot of us, we're just kind of feeling beat up, right? Our joints are beat up from years of abuse. Our livers beat up from, from years of, of, of alcohol abuse, if you will. Um, a lot of these guys now, not me, I've taken pretty good care of myself, but a lot of these guys have not had a good quality diet. And so I think one of the overarching questions that's important for people to understand who may be starting to or have been feeling pretty run down for a long period of time, feeling pretty lethargic, uh, poor sleep, low libido, right? All of these uh, symptoms of not only aging, but low testosterone is from a, a professional like you. When is it appropriate? for guys like us to consider testosterone replacement therapy? Very valid question. So considering therapy really should be a shared decision between a qualified and competent provider and the patient. When it comes to actually diagnosing or going in for, for diagnostics uh, and an assessment, that is up to the patient to make the first move. I'd love to knock on your door, grab you by the wrist and drag you out. Unfortunately, I have to wait for you to walk in. The sad truth is that, you know, men are egotistical. You know, we're, we're in, mm -hmm. back in the old days, you and I are similar in age, but you recall back when we started driving, we didn't have fancy GPS systems in the cars. So we used to get directions, write them down, roam out on a map, look for the exits, you know, make a left at the train station, you turn at the right. gas station, et cetera. And then we'd find ourselves circling for about an hour. And, you know, people would say, hey, why don't you stop totally. and ask? And you say, no, no, no totally. I got it. I got it. 
right? I'll figure it out. So, so women go through menopause and the first thing they do is they run out and they say, oh my God, I got hot flashes. I'm moody, this and that. I can't sleep. I'm hot. I'm cold. Help me. I need help. I need to fix something is wrong, right? Men, unfortunately, go through something called andropause. And for many people, that is a foreign word that they've never heard before, but it's a real word. And it's not very masculine to admit that you are going through something or you're essentially becoming less masculine than you used to be. It's, it's kind of a scary thought for men. But, you know, we do wake up one day and we look in the mirror and we see our dad and we say, what the hell happened? Where did my life go? And if you wait until you are well into andropause, which, by the way, on average starts in your early 30s, believe it or not. And each year now, due to various endocrine disrupting compounds in our environment, the advancement of technology and a more sedentary lifestyle, people are starting to experience symptoms of low T. And by the way, low T is a symptom. It is not a diagnosis. The diagnosis I'll get into a little bit later. But people are starting to experience low T symptoms far earlier than they used to. So if you look at the studies that they show that over generational uh, timeframes, our grandfathers had significantly almost double the natural tea levels that we have today at any given age. Right. So the world has changed. The quality of our food has changed. The stress levels and the, the you know, initiation of social media, putting all this, all this undue stress on people to keep up with, with their peers. Uh, everybody's posting all the perfect lifestyle, the vacations, right. the cars, the homes. They're not talking about their problems out there. So you think you're the only person on earth going through things. So people are starting to get all this stress and all this allostatic loads that is really crashing down their endocrine system. Uh, antidepressants are grossly overly prescribed in this country to mask the symptoms and really put a Band-Aid. And they, they often cause other sexual dysfunction, worsen signs and symptoms uh, of these diseases. Uh, blood pressure medications, statins, right. Right. diabetes, all of these are so prevalent in America. For my doctorate, one of my research um, papers I did was on population healthcare. And I found that the U.S. is by far almost double the second place country, uh, 38 countries that are wealthy nations in this group. The U.S. spends more than double on healthcare each year than the number two country in this, in this group. And yet we are the sickest nation on earth. Okay. Something is really broken in this healthcare system. I like to call it the sick care system because right. there's nothing healthy about it. So the problem is now men are coming in younger and younger. We're getting guys in their 20s. I had a 24-year-old patient walk in last, last week complaining of low T symptoms. And oftentimes they'd be written off, but you know what? He came back actually low. And it was testicular hypofunction. It was primary hypogonadism. He had testicular failure at 24 years old. Something is wrong here. But for the most part, men should not wait until things get really bad. Because when you wait until things get really bad, you don't only have to fix the underlying condition that brought you there. Now you have to fix the damage. So if I'm driving down the road over a bed of nails and I get a flat tire, sweeping the nails away is not going to fix my tire. Now I have a double tiered approach right. to fix this. But if I presume that those nails are going to be there and I took uh, action in advance, I never would have had the flat. So I urge men starting in their early to mid thirties, for sure by 35, to seek a competent provider, whether it's us or, or anybody who, who's doing this correctly, which sadly most are not, but we'll get into that. Seek a competent provider, go out and at least have an assessment once a year, have the proper labs done, have a conversation about your signs and symptoms, get the subjective data out there with the provider, get the objective data, put it together and come up with either a treatment plan or a plan of action to reassess at a future date. Don't wait until you're 50 years old and you wake up with type 2 diabetes or yeah. insulin resistance, you know, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Uh, erectile dysfunction, and then go in and say, what the heck's going on with me? And now we have 10 years, 15 years of damage to unravel. So start in your mid thirties and get it done correctly and take a prophylactic approach before you have damage. Yeah. I'd like to come back to the um, getting the assessment and identifying a qualified practitioner. So, so let's kind of table that, come back to that. And, and then um, just speaking to obviously the disadvantage that we're all at just living in today's world, right? We're bombarded with environmental toxicity, like you said, and stress and poor food quality. And so how much of this would you contribute to uh, of the suppression in our testosterone levels uh, to the environment relative to just the normal aging process? Because you did mention that for our grandparents, normal testosterone levels, you know, 
compared to age would be significantly higher? Yes, that's a good question. So there's a couple of types of, of hypogonadism, which is a fancy term to just state, you know, low, low T or, or your testicles are not producing sufficient levels of T. The first cause is called primary, primary hypogonadism. And primary signifies that the organ or gland designed to produce testosterone in a man, which is the testes, has failed. And that is usually indicative of an age-related ailment. So as men age, their biological age of their testicles, which are designed for testosterone and also spermatogenesis for fertility and conception, is diminished. And as a result of that, we notice that testicular failure is more common in guys that are middle-aged and up. So let's say guys our age and up is usually when you'll discover that. Mostly so in their 40, 50s. 40 and up. 45, 50s. 55, yeah. 60. Yeah. So it's rare to see a guy at 30, let's say, with testicular hypofunction. With that said, there is something called secondary hypogonadism. So if we understand the HPTA or hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis of the endocrine system, it's a negative feedback. And it begins with the hypothalamus releasing a gonadotropic releasing signal that hits the pituitary and signifies a luteinizing hormone, which is a signaling agent going down to the testicles via the bloodstream to hit the latex cells and stimulate testosterone production. Now, what happens is when that signaling agent is absent from the brain, the testicles may be perfectly fine, but they're not being stimulated in order to kick into action and produce testosterone. Got it. So often when we find younger guys complaining of low T symptoms, and in fact, their labs confirm low testosterone, it is often associated with the secondary where the pituitary gland is suppressed. That could be due to head trauma, concussions, TBIs. It could be due to depression, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, or even certain medications that they're taking, as well as stress and lack of sleep. So there's a whole slew of lifestyle things that could be manipulated easier said than done, but could be manipulated. Mm. Try to kickstart that testicular axis again via the luteinizing hormone signal of the interior pituitary. The problem is that we're now seeing younger guys coming in with primary hypogonadism, and it isn't always due to testicular injury. So that is extremely concerning. Our food sources are being turned over and over, right? You talk to farmers. I, I happen to live in a town over here in central Jersey that's full of horses and farms. And I see farms being turned over every six to eight weeks. The nutrients in the soil are absent. We're eating fiber these days. There's really no nutrition anymore. You know, I, I suffered from some, some gastric issues for a couple of months. I went overseas for one week. I changed nothing mm. in my diet. I just went overseas. Everything went away. As soon as I came back to the US, my stomach issues re resumed. The quality of food in America is poisoned and it is malnourished. And this is really leading to a, a massive concern. What can we do about that? I'm unsure, but it does require more fingers on the trigger to try to assess and fix the problem on the endocrine level. I'm not sure what we could do on the nutritional level. Yeah. I do know what we could do, and that's go out and get tested and assessed for hormones younger than we should have to. Yeah, that's pretty scary. I mean, when you consider, and, and that's, by the way, not the first time I've heard that. We have a myriad of clients who we hear from all the time who go travel abroad and come back and they're like, yeah, I ate all of the things and I lost weight and I feel great and much different than the food quality, obviously, that we are um, assaulted with. We lead the with. world in diabetes and we lead the world in obesity. <clears throat> that yeah, in so and of itself is a lifestyle problem that is not being addressed and it's becoming younger. You're old enough to remember when type 2 diabetes was called adult onset. Adult diabetes, onset. Yeah. And type 1 was called pediatric. Yeah. Right. And the yeah. difference is type 1 is a full failure of the beta cells of the pancreas. You no longer produce insulin. Type 2 is insulin resistance. In other words, type 2, when they say it runs in my family, type 2 is something that you cause to yourself. Well, it's scary. Right? It runs in your family because of bad habits. Right. Yeah. And, exactly. it's, and it's and fully kids are controllable. Getting it. Children exactly. are coming down with type two. It's, it's very, very, very worrisome. Not only are children coming down with type two, but now they're talking about preventative medicine and surgery for children to mitigate the weight gain. And, and that, you know, that's happening. And so it is, it, it's obviously a very scary, very complex with that said. And I think it begs the question then on this topic here, because Speaking of ego, speaking of guys, is a lot of guys, and and frankly, a lot of practitioners will come from the stance of even if your levels are low, 
This is something that you can manage with improving your nutrition, your lifestyle, your training. I would love to hear your standpoint as a clinician around what you've observed, perhaps on both sides in terms of if I'm a 43-year-old male, we uh, diagnose that uh, my testosterone levels are abnormally low, uh, both total and free. And you know, from there is, do I just say, well, I could be sleeping better. I could obviously be improving my nutrition, managing my stress levels. Is that enough? Very good question. Um, Allie loves the analogy I gave at her Silverback Summit when I spoke about primary hypogonadism. Um, primary hypogonadism in layman's terms just simply means your balls are dead. And if they're dead, they're dead. If I burn the factory down, I can hire all the workers in the world. Right. And I'm still not producing anything because I burned the factory to the ground. So if your balls are dead, all the sleep and all the lifestyle changes and all the nutrition, you can beat it to death. You're going to have low T. If your pituitary is hypofunctioning or malfunctioning and is not sending down a signaling agent, depending on your age, your desire to attempt your previous history and attempts, successes or failures with lifestyle changes, because it's very easy to tell someone to do something you know, on paper, in the real world, does it actually translate to action? Because you know, how many times have guys gone to the doctor and they said, your blood pressure is high? And the guy says, well, I don't want medication. Let me eat better. Let me work out. Let me lose weight. They come back six months later. Guess what? It's the same or it's worse. So mm -hmm. people actually implementing it is one thing and actually talking about it is another. So if let's just assume, let's give people benefit of the doubt. Let's assume they're going to go out and execute the plan naturally. If you have secondary hypogonadism and your testicular function is still intact, which is to be determined once the signaling engine comes back, because you can have a primary and secondary hypogonadal state simultaneously. And, to, and if, to be clear, this is something that you can test for. Yes. So I test it both in labs, and I also have a very lengthy subjective conversation with my patients. I ask a lot of questions because I have experience with thousands of guys doing this. I can assess a guy usually within the first five minutes of speaking to them but as they're feeding me information, you know how like the new AI chatbots, like the more, the more people do searches, the smarter they get. Right. The more information you give me, the more I can spit out an assessment. So I'm going to initially ask a ton of questions and I want short, quick answers. I don't need the backstory. I just want the short, quick answers because I know where I'm leading with it. And that assessment data allows me to very quickly and efficiently diagnose the root of the problem. What I don't like to do is to put Band-Aids on things, because when you put Band-Aids, you have to keep ripping them off and putting new Band-Aids on, but you've never fixed the problem, right? So if you got mold in the wall and I wallpaper it, it looks beautiful, but you still got mold in the wall. I like to gut the damn wall and clean it out and rebuild the wall. So I need to assess what's the root cause of your problem and fix it, not only so it looks pretty on the surface and you have a nice framed lab to hang on your refrigerator and show mom, I want to ensure this problem doesn't return. I'm looking to give people a good quality of life for as long as possible. And mm -hmm. the only way we can do that is fix the underlying problem. We don't sweep the dirt under the rug. We vacuum it up, we mop the floor, and then we set the rug back down. And right. it is very important to be able to diagnose the cause of the low T symptoms rather than just say, you have low T, let's do X, Y, Z. Yeah, absolutely. And so what I'm hearing is then by virtue of, of, of identifying the primary cause of the low T, then you'll have uh, the roadmap, so to speak, of how to move forward. With that said, obviously, it's advantageous for someone to still address their nutrition and lifestyle factors. Regardless of T, if in fact you're self-sabotaging and that is the root cause of your problem, that may, may fix it to be determined. Even if it's not the root cause of your problem and we have to take pharmacological interventions, by all means, you should still lead a healthy lifestyle for many other reasons. Right. It's and synergistic. So, totally. And, and so with that said, like, what are the primary saboteurs that we're seeing? I mean, you did, obviously, you mentioned environmental exposure, but let's talk about the things that we really have control over for the, the average person um, that is going to help with this process. Sleep quality, first and foremost. I know easier said than done. People always yeah. say, how do I do that? For starters, assess what you're doing every night. Assess your habits. Put away your electronics and your phones at least one hour before you go to bed. Get rid of that artificial light. The pineal gland in your brain produces melatonin. And that is a sleep hormone. And it is very light. It is a photosensitive gland. 
So we're trained to, you know, have the sunlight or the UV light hit our eye and let us know it is time to be up. It is time to be energized. Okay, there's a reason vitamin D comes from the sun. There's a reason it's responsible for many things, including energy. Uh, we need to have light in order to feel energetic. If you've ever felt moody, down, depressed, tired on a rainy, cloudy day, it's no coincidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, the sun helps. So if your body thinks the sun is out because you've got an iPhone or an iPad or a laptop or a television glued to your face, you're not producing melatonin. And now you're shutting it off and you're hoping to pass out in the next five minutes and your mind's racing. Okay. You have to understand right. that you're disrupting your natural body and the pathways by which you fall asleep. Second, you have mental stimulation. You're reading news, politics, fighting on Facebook with your friends and all this other stuff. Now you're going to sleep and your mind's racing. You need to relax. You need to listen to music. You need to meditate. You need to do whatever it is that you do to relax. Have, have some warm tea. Relax before bed for, for starters. Have set bedtimes, okay? Set an alarm. Don't say, I'll wake up when I wake up. Set an alarm. Try to keep some level of consistency. I know, again, easier said than done. We have patients with shift work, cops, firemen. They do 24s, doctors, nurses, and hospitals. We have many people who don't have the luxury of, of a good sleep schedule. But sleep is number one. There's many other lifestyle things you could do. Okay. Nutrition, about, exercise. Again, what in about a alcohol? world, Let, I can write you a blueprint in the real yeah. world. People don't adhere. Well, let's talk alcohol because I think that is definitely a huge saboteur for people. And, and, you know, I'm tired, I'm getting tired of, of, of saying it. So I'd love to hear from you, from the clinician of, you know, what do you see in terms of medically speaking, what happens when we're drinking alcohol? People are not going to be happy with my answer. But oh, I am shit. extremely direct. I never aim to be popular. I aim to be honest. And you honesty just, is never popular. You don't want the truth. I am you not a diplomat. I'd, I'd make a terrible politician because I tell it like it is. But let me give you the facts. When I had my gyms and I used to write all the nutrition programs, it was usually the women that would come up and say, hey, I like to have you know, a glass of wine on a Friday night. Can I still have my glass of wine and lose weight? And my answer was yes but you're going to lose it at a slower pace. And they said, why? It's only one glass. And then they would start with their resveratrol and it's good for your heart. I said, listen, alcohol is alcohol is alcohol. Every ounce of alcohol that goes into your bloodstream does you no favors. Now, as an adult, you're going to make a decision. You're going to run with that decision. You're going to own that decision. So if you choose to do it, that's okay. But don't sell yourself on something that isn't true. Understand that you're slowing down and sabotaging your progress. And if you're okay with that trade-off, enjoy your glass of wine. Yep. When I competed three years, I had no alcohol, no pizza, no ice cream. And people are going to say, well, that's no way to live, but it's a personal decision. I'm not asking people to get on a stage and compete on a national level. I'm asking people to, to first and foremost in everything in life, identify your goals and priorities. Start with a blueprint. We don't build a house by grabbing a hammer and some wood. We go to an architect and we draw a plan. Start a plan on everything, business, health, et cetera, whatever your goals, weight loss, Start a plan, draw a blueprint, sit down and write your top priorities in order of priority, and then address those. Because you cannot demand priority number four to come into play when priority number one is alcohol or number two is alcohol. So every ounce of alcohol you put in your body is the equivalent of your liver saying, I'm going to stop producing cholesterol, which by the way, you'll die without cholesterol. You need cholesterol. Every cell in your body has it. Every hormone is made from it you will stop producing cholesterol, you will stop cleansing everything else, you will stop producing sex hormone binding global and all these other things that your liver does. And all hands on deck are get that alcohol out of my system, right? Your liver and your kidneys, you know, metabolize that alcohol, get it to the kidneys, urinate, get this poison out of my system. So for about 24 to 48 hours after a sip of alcohol, your fat burning affects your lipolysis, the reason that you're training and eating and sleeping and recovering is put on the back burner, it's on hold. And people say, I only have two drinks a week. Well, that means that 40% of your week, you're not losing weight. 40% of your week, you're not optimizing your health. And again, I'm not here to tell people not to drink socially. I'm here to tell you what happens in your body. As an adult, you're going to make the decision yourself. Totally. I know it's not fun to hear, but zero alcohol is the best way to be healthy. And every ounce of alcohol is putting you on hold and possibly taking you a step backwards. With that said, you make your own decisions. Yeah, do whatever you want to do. But I think right. that's it's just important for people to understand and hear. There's no good alcohol. There's no healthy alcohol. Yeah. There's no moderately healthy alcohol. You poison yourself every time you take a drink. Listen, I I have 
alcohol. Like I make the decisions. I'm fully aware of the repercussions. Likewise, today I do as well. Right. But I'm, so I'm, I'm accepting of what I'm doing. A hundred percent. And that's all people just need to be informed to be able to make those decisions and not tell themselves stories around why they can't lose weight. It's just acknowledge. You know, if adults that, took accountability for things in life, the world would be so much more pleasant. It would. Every aspect. It's We talk about it a lot. It's like personal Every generation responsibility. Is losing accountability. This is the problem. It, you go from being accountable to being entitled as, as I'm seeing generation after generation coming in with a sense of entitlement. There's yep. no more taking accountability. You know, I tapped someone's bumper and I couldn't find the owner of the vehicle. I left my cell phone number. They called me and I didn't want to use my deductible. I wrote a check. I mean, I could have, nobody saw it. It was night. Yeah, right. It's called accountability. It's called doing the right thing. Be accountable for yourself the same way you're accountable to your money and to your business. Be accountable yeah. to yourself. Extreme ownership, man. Big fan. We've we've covered the surface level of you know, testosterone replacement, why someone would want to reach out, why they want to uh, understand and, and at least get blood work run, even if they're the type of person, because there's plenty of guys who are like, you know what, I haven't had blood work run in years, because frankly, I just don't want to see it, right? Mm -hmm. um, which obviously is a mistake in and of itself. And but so back to the ego thing, guys don't go to the doctor unless we're sick. Right, right. And so being proactive about this process, especially if you're interested in being healthy, living a long time, being there for your family, being there for your community, being lean and healthy and strong and, and all of those things that we want as, as men and frankly, as women too today. So I said that we would come back to this because it's not always as easy, in my opinion, to just get blood work run and just get an appropriate diagnosis because I think that with the increase in popularity of testosterone replacement and hormone replacement, I think that there's um, obviously an increasing number of practitioners and doctors that are prescribing and treating that perhaps are underqualified to be able to do this given the progressive nature of this field. Mm -hmm. So I would love your opinion on that and how someone would go about actually getting the appropriate diagnosis and treatment plan. It's very saddening to me. And I actually spoke to Ali about it this morning. I'm in the process of putting together because I've, I've trained and, and spoke at many events. I've trained many physicians and, 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 and mid-levels uh, throughout the years on how to do this correctly, purely out of passion. I feel that if I help a patient, I helped an individual. And if I help a provider, then I may have helped 2000 individuals. So I like to train providers on how to do this correctly. Uh, I am always open to evolve and progress and learn and 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 do evidence-based research to to enhance my own knowledge. None of us are born with knowledge. We gain it through clinical experience, through anecdotal case studies, and through discussing this with peers. And it's very important that we read the research and interpret it correctly. Sadly, most of the providers in this country, endocrinologists, urologists, primary care physicians, they do not prescribe and treat hormones for men correctly. Now, total testosterone is a test that everyone's familiar with. Sadly, it is a very, very, very poor benchmark to test and treat by. There's many other underlying factors when treating sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG, which I, I briefly touched on from the liver conversation, is a very key metric that I look at. Many older guys have optimal or elevated or good total testosterone levels, but it is secondary to an elevation in SHBG, which is a binding protein. Without getting too deep into the science behind that in this, in this conversation, I need to point out that many guys in, in, in the field, many, many, many physicians don't understand the importance of SHBG and the role it plays within hormone treatment and management. And the initial diagnostic and assessment is also indicative of where that level is. So free testosterone is a derivative uh, via formula of SHBG coupled with total T. But when SHBG is elevated, you get a false sense of security that your T is optimal, and it really isn't. So I see guys in their 60s coming in saying, yeah, I had my T done last year, my, my family doc, and you know, he said it was 450, and that's great for a 65-year-old. Well, what else did he test? My testosterone. Okay. That's a flawed approach. Okay. So right. then I have a 30-minute conversation to educate a patient. But if I could educate the provider, we would have such a better systemic understanding in this country. And, and we're doing that, but it's hard to get the reach out there. We would have such a better understanding of, of how to treat this correctly. So I spoke to Ali this morning. I'm actually in the process of putting together a group that providers can, for, for minimal, you know, just to cover the overhead on that, the minimal expenses, just to get in there and be able to, to have a large group 
of, of, of colleagues that can learn, can integrate with each other, can ask questions, and we can, we can help each other grow and fully understand. I have hundreds of videos that I've made over the years, similar to this, but on specific topics on our website, elevatewellnessgroup.com. If you go up top and click on knowledge base, I have sexual dysfunction, lifestyle, fitness, nutrition, cognition, uh, hormone optimization, literally hundreds of hours of videos that I've produced for free for both patients and providers alike to go in there and, and educate themselves. Because I feel that when you give a patient autonomy to fully understand and take charge of their health, mm-hmm. and you're there as their coach rather than the player, they feel more empowered. It's part of their healing process. It's part of their treatment plan. And ultimately, you're, you're spreading the wealth of knowledge around. Uh, and it just, to me, it's always about education. It's always about providing and empowering other people rather than just saying, take this and trust me. You know I what, want that's... to be questioned. I want people to fully understand the mechanism of what's going on in their body. I want them to know what this medication is doing within their body rather than just say, I take A, therefore I'm B. Okay, I mm-hmm. want that. You know, it, the, the more someone wants to learn, the more enthused I am to spend time with that individual. Well, it's necessary now because there's so many methodologies out there. It's the same when we look at nutrition. It's like you're getting all of this confusing and contradictory in, information constantly. Mm -hmm. And we are no longer in our parents' generation where it was simply do as the doctor says, right? right? Well, the doctor said to my mom says it all the time. That's what the doctor said. So I'm just doing it, right? Blindly having faith in medical system, like whatever, we're not going to go down that road. But the point is you research a car, you know, buying a car far more than the the drugs that you're putting in your body. And so educate yourself. Um, understand a little bit more about exactly what it is we're talking about. That's probably why you're listening to this podcast in the first place, because you're and kudos to you for wanting to get a better understanding of how you can improve your health and take ownership over that process. So that's good stuff. Uh, so that if and when you do go to a practitioner, at least you can be informed, right? At least you can understand, well, did they do total testosterone and free testosterone and sex hormone binding globulin and do I have some semblance of an idea of, of what all of this means so that I can have a knowledgeable conversation and be involved in the process, right? You know what concerns me a lot is when people come and saying, what labs should I ask my doctor to run? That's like going into a mechanic shop with a problem in your car and saying, what tools should I bring my mechanic to fix it? Yeah. You're going to a professional. It's not your duty to teach them how to do this job. If you feel that you need to go in and tell them what to run and tell them what to ask for and tell them how to treat and what doses to use, are they a prescription pad or are they the right person to look out for you? Because what happens when something goes sideways? What happens when you have a sign or symptom that manifests over time that you don't know how to treat because you're not supposed to know how to treat it? Are they going to know what to do or are you going to suffer? Because I get so many transfer patients, they come in with a list of medication that's being sold. And I ask them, why are you taking this? Because they told me that I need it. But what does right. it do? I'm not sure. That concerns me a lot. 100%. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So I think that I would like to shift the conversation a little bit since you mentioned, and I'm, I'm intrigued about some of these weight loss drugs that are now becoming extremely popular on the market. And, and, and so I want to use the rest of our time and obviously I want to respect your time. Um, but I, I would like to use a little bit of time just to talk about some of the popular weight loss drugs, um, kind of mechanism of action, who they're relevant for and really how beneficial they are, what we're seeing perhaps from the research and anecdotally in, in terms of the long term. Around because we had mentioned Ozempic, we mentioned semaglutide, terzapidine. Is that uh, one Terzeptipide, of the newer? Terzapidine, Monjaro essentially is the name. Yeah. Brand. Yeah. yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about because there's this big push um, to people leveraging that that are not type two diabetic uh, are wanting to lose body fat mm-hmm. to leverage some of these weight loss drugs, obviously to lose weight. Um, so tell us a little bit about those and kind of what you're seeing? So metabolic syndrome is a big, big pandemic in this country. And it manifests with several different things. Insulin resistance, which is essentially type 2 diabetes is one. Obesity is another. There's a number of things that are used to assess metabolic syndromes. 
So naturally, when you become insulin resistant, you're going to gain body fat. And if you have elevated body fat, typically, not always, but typically, you may become insulin resistant because the same lifestyle that brought you to one essentially leads to the other over time. Now, you couple that with low testosterone, low estradiol, uh, and that generally also manifests into type 2 diabetes, which is why men often develop it later in life as their testosterone level is reduced. So while one medication may be specifically indicated by the FDA for weight loss and one may be indicated for diabetes, I'm not worried about the social labels that are put on it. I'm more concerned with, again, the mechanism of action. What does this medication do inside the body? These compounds are molecules and atoms that are made up of molecular structures that act on receptors within our body to cause a chemical reaction. That is going to remain the same, and they don't care what you or the FDA or I have to say or what name we put on the label. So let's look at the science behind it. Ozempic is a name brand for medication, which is semaglutide. They're one in the same, okay? One is a generic name and one is the, the, the brand. This is a medication that initially was approved for diabetics, type 2 diabetics. And what it does is it acts on a, a, a peptide in your, in your or a hormone called GLP-1 or glucagon-like mm -hmm. peptide 1. And it does a very good job specifically at doing two things. One, it improves insulin sensitivity. You know, insulin is a very powerful anabolic hormone in your body produced by your, your pancreas. And when your blood sugar is constantly high, which could be indicative of your A1C, hemoglobin A1C is a 90-day average in percentage. So like a hemoglobin A1C of a 5.7 means that 5.7% of your blood is made up of glucose. And the, the higher the glucose content in your blood, the thicker the blood. And that's why it causes circulatory issues and diabetics get uh, peripheral neuropathy, you know, cold and, and, and tingling in their fingers and toes, et cetera, vision issues. So this medication increases the sensitivity of the insulin receptors. It helps to control blood sugar by regulating insulin production in the pancreas and allowing that insulin to go further. So less insulin will do a better job at removing glucose from the blood and into the cell where it can pr produce energy or ATP in the mitochondria. That is essentially the reversal, arresting and reversal of type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance or prediabetes. So that is a good thing. That will always make you healthier to reduce your A1C and control your blood sure. sugars. Second, it also increases the satiety hormone. So essentially, you feel mm -hmm. fuller longer. So you have less of an appetite. It doesn't mean that you're going to starve. It simply means that you're going to have smaller meals and you're going to have less frequent meals. This results in an overall caloric decrease in your daily intake. Your total daily energy expenditure may increase as your A1C is decreased because your energy levels increase. You may be more active. At the same time, the compounding effect is that you're taking in less daily calories. Right. And as a result, your energy balance may flip from a surplus to a deficit. Not may, it certainly will because I've seen severe suppression on, uh, on cravings specifically for the sweets and the junk food that people tend to crave, the emotional eating, the boredom eating tends to cease and the cravings tend to cease. So long as you're continuing to eat protein, fiber, quality starches, like rice and potatoes, rather than, you know, ice cream and cheesecake. And again, this will help with those cravings. You're going to continually make progress in preserving muscle tissue while generating lipolysis, which is fat loss. So I am generally opposed to medical weight loss, like fentamine or, or Adderall or you know any of these stimulants that have other side effects. I don't like to reward poor lifestyle choices with pharmacological agents and say, well, if you're not willing to exercise, you're not willing to eat well, you're not willing to do this and that, why don't you just take a pill? I am not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of gastric bypass unless you're morbidly obese, okay? I don't like shortcuts. I don't like liposuction. I don't like it. I like hard work. I like understanding of what's going on. And I like to help people get off to a good start, not just tell them to do it, but actually get them to do it and understand it and motivate them. Mm -hmm. So when we couple semaglutide, which is the first medication for weight loss that I'm actually excited about because we've had great success with patients um, and, 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 and it's actually something that makes you healthier. It doesn't harm you. It actually makes you overall healthier. Uh, it's been phenomenal. The downside is Ozempic is very expensive, extremely uh, it's over $1,000 a month to buy the commercial product. Mm. Uh, we have compounding pharmacies for now that are able to produce semaglutide for us uh, at literally about a third of the cost. And we're able to run 90-day you know, periods for patients, titrating up to, to 
you know, make sure that we, uh, we mitigate any potential uh, nausea, which is sometimes a, a side effect. Uh, but we do fairly well with mitigating it by titrating up. We couple that with a easy to follow meal plan. It doesn't, it doesn't include counting calories or any of that stuff or, you know, following, you know, my fitness pal or macronutrients. We do that work for the patient. So when we give them a meal plan, it's literally all the foods they love, chicken, tuna, uh, potatoes, rice, vegetables, you know, all, all the good stuff that they probably eat anyway, uh, you know, avocados, whatever. We put it together in like a pie chart and it's color coded and it just tells them how much, you know, take a fist size of chicken, yeah, you know, sure. take half a cup of rice, take this, take that. There's your, there's your lunch, <clears throat> there's your dinner. So we make it easy to follow for that time period. And we've seen guys and girls, you know, who, who aren't morbidly obese, but you know, in a realm of, Hey, I need to lose some weight, lose you know 30 to 40 pounds over the first 90 days and what actually we keep it off. What are we seeing about the long-term repercussions? Is it something that they have to stay on? You know, from what I understand is, is obviously like, you know, you said that the, the medication um, creates a, a much more significant level of satiety. So therefore you are not hungry. You're not going to eat as much food. You said uh, it's going to help therefore increase insulin sensitivity. It sounds like that there's a corresponding increase in mitochondrial function, increase in energy production, which is all great. What are we seeing in terms of long-term, you know, use? Is it something you have to be on forever? I am um, not a fan. Uh, so in general, my philosophy is minimal effective medication, minimal effective dosing to get the job done. I don't like to put anybody on something indefinitely unless it's needed. So when it comes to this drug, first of all, you don't need to lose weight forever. You need to hit a target goal, a healthy weight, and maintain. So a lot of the psychological studies say that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. Breaking habits is nearly impossible. Replacing habits is a much more sustainable way. So we're never going to tell someone to stop something. We're going to tell them to do something different that is mm -hmm. better for them. When it comes to eating, you're not going to take food away. You're going to replace food. And if they can do that for 90 days, that's the 21 days over and over and over about four and a half times. So if you can have habits, healthy habits for 90 days, there's nothing more motivating for an individual than actual tangible results. When they see the weight come off, when they feel the weight come off, people start to compliment them. They're fitting into clothes that they haven't worn in 10 years. That in and of itself is such a driving force in people's minds to continue the progress with less and less need and eventually no need for any exterior intervention. So when you pull the drug, Will their appetite be as suppressed as it was? No. Will their habits be significantly better? Will they be accustomed to meal prepping more, to making healthier choices, to not going out to the junk food restaurants that they've been going to for five years because they right. haven't been there in three months? Yes. Will they have a healthier lifestyle of now hitting the gym instead of hitting the ice cream parlor? Right? So what we're doing is we're using the 90 days to kind of make a mind shift as well as a body shift. And if people really grasp into that concept, and again, take control and accountability, success is phenomenal. If people sure. are going to use this as a crutch, the minute you pull the crutch, you know, right. th there's no saying where they're going to go, which is, again, why I've always been opposed to medical intervention for weight loss, because I've always advocated for lifestyle changes. This is another motivating factor for the lifestyle change, because it makes the results come sooner, and it makes you healthier at the same time. But the lifestyle, this, I will not prescribe this medication to anyone who does not have a consultation to understand the mindset and accepting of the meal plan that we provide. A lot of guys, you know, a lot of clinics I've seen out there, you know, you pay them a fee, they write your prescription, have a nice day. I want to understand that you're going to follow the meal plan. I want to understand that you're going to follow a lifestyle because I'm not here to give you a crutch. I'm here to give you a package of success. I don't like failures. I take it personally. Well, I think that's the hardest thing with any, you know, transformation, any weight loss change. Any physique change is replacing those behaviors, like you said, and and that absolutely takes you know some considerable time for a lot of people because obviously it it revolves around them changing their identity. And so, the way I can see it is absolutely being a strong driver of positive momentum to help them start to make that shift, right? To give them a really positive stepping stone. My most successful patients are the ones who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You well, have we, to reach we, a breaking point to really make a change. I mean, the only change we're going to make is driven by pain, right? And it so is. it's it's ultimately understanding that the life that you're living is no longer serving you and, and you need to step into some new behaviors. Wants are greater than needs and pain is greater than wants. 
being pain-free is the biggest desire and getting what you want is a big desire. Getting what you need is always on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Gil, man, it's been an absolute pleasure having the opportunity to chat with you. We're obviously on the same page on so many levels and I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with our listeners. Um, Gil, where can people check you out? So nextleveldietetics.com is where they can do a one-on-one consultation with me uh, via Zoom or phone, uh, usually for about 30 minutes or so. Talk about any topic that they, that they wish to discuss. I'm open to anything. I do a lot of international that way. And people who happen to be in the US and, and need some level of hormone uh, guidance or, or, or medical treatment, I would take their consultation from there and I would just shift it over to my clinic and we can manage that via telemedicine, send out for diagnostic labs, uh, do a consultation, prescribe medication, ship to their house, manage them on an ongoing basis, all available through nextleveldietetics.com by booking a consultation. Uh, and then if they want to just watch some of my videos and learn, they can go to elevatewellnessgroup.com, my medical office, and right up at the top, uh, click on knowledge base and then videos. And you've got tons of free content there just to educate yourself. Beautiful. Well, make sure you guys go check out Gil if you're interested in finding out more information about testosterone replacement. And yeah, thanks, brother. We'll have to have you on again. Uh, Definitely a topic that I want to hit on in the near future is peptides. And I know you're an expert there. So we will uh, have you back. Meanwhile, thank you so much. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity so much. Take care.